Okay, so good afternoon, even though we have not finished the lunch. <laughs> I'm standing between you and lunch, so uh, let me try to share some of the things, um, what we have been doing. Um, once again, it is very pleasure to be here. This is the first uh, uh, UK conference. I have been to the other, other ones. Um, so what today I'll be talking is basically like, how do you design all these different middlewares, like the, for HPC, big data, deep learning, and also trying to put them into the cloud. Um, and this is the kind of the where we are as a community. As you know, like the number one system, the summit, is currently delivering around 149 petaflops. And uh, the community is waiting uh, for the exascale system to come. There is a lot of discussion, whether it's the next year by some country, or um, at least uh, in US, whatever has been publicly indicated, the A21 system at Argon. Uh, will be in the 21. Now, of course, in this, uh, we heard several talks also here. Um, there is a lot of uh, focus these days uh, to uh, have converged software stacks. Like when we are saying convergence, it's not only HPC, big data, and deep learning, not only trying to run them on the dedicated environments, but also how do we move this into the cloud, also trying to get the uh, best performance. So in this context, in my group, we have been working for several years, and I'll try to share some of the results, what we have obtained, and some of the software stacks which are publicly available. So in our context, trying to define the convergence, so this is what we, we um, have been working on. So let's say you have an HPC cluster, just like um, we have been talking here, a bunch of nodes. You might have some resource manager like Turk or Slurm. Uh, you can have some parallel file system like Luster or GPFS. Now the question is on this system, can we run all these different kinds of jobs in a concurrent manner. So typically what has happened, like sometimes people have a separate Hadoop cluster or a separate Spark cluster, separate MPI cluster, and then keep on moving the data back and forth. And as we know, the moving the data back and forth is not always efficient. So this is the kind of the vision uh, we are trying to provide that on the exactly on the same system, just like you might have multiple MPI libraries and you make them available as modules to the users, can you do similar kind of things even for the Hadoop, Spark, as well as for deep learning, okay? So that's what will be the more or less like the, uh, the storyline I'll be trying to present. Um, so in that context, um, I'll try to highlight four of these projects in my group we have been working on. So the first one is of course MRAPIS project uh, that has been running for many years. And then the high BD, which is high performance big data project uh, uh, for the Hadoop, Spark, all kinds of big data analytics library. Then we have the high performance deep learning. And then I'll be talking about our public cloud deployment. We have been working uh, very closely, uh, Gilad indicated, with uh, Microsoft Azure, also Amazon AWS. And just now we have started talking to also Oracle Cloud. Uh, so we are gradually moving all of our software stacks to these cloud environments. So I'll try to share some of the um, initial numbers there. So as many of you know, in all these kind of discussions, always the question arises, what is the parallel programming model? Let's just start from the scientific side. Uh, most of us are familiar uh, with MPI. That has been the de facto standard uh, for all kinds of scientific applications. Of course, within the node, we get the shared memory, which is a cache coherent shared memory. But you cannot scale it to very large scale system. That's why in the, a lot of people have been talking about this partition global address space, or called PGAS. So that is the kind of the next uh, wave, which is coming off this open SMAM, um, UPC, UPC++, et cetera. So in this context, um, um, I'll introduce this MHAPIS project, uh, which has been there for many years. So how many of you are familiar with this, this project? Okay, several of you, that's good. So in fact, um, we were the very first one when InfiniBand came in October 2000, almost 19 years back, we were the very first ones to jump in. Prior to that, we were working on in my group on Marinette, Quadrix, a lot of those kind of older systems. So we had our first open source MHAPIC released in supercomputing 2002. And since then, we have been continuously working um, on enhancing it all different fronts. I'll be talking about that. And uh, so this project is continuing for 18 years now. And uh, currently, these stacks are being used by more than 3,000 organizations in 89 countries. These are based on voluntary registration. A lot of people download, they don't want to identify, that's okay with us. But based on like if they have identified an organization name, and we put those um, into the MAPH project, if you go under the users, you will see that. 
Uh, last uh, November, in fact, we crossed half a million downloads just from our website, and it is steadily increasing. Very soon, we'll reach um, 600,000 downloads um, in another uh, one month or two. So it is not just the downloads, but we have been enabling a lot of these large-scale systems. Um, starting from like Sunway Tile Light, we also have our versions running on Summit and Sierra. Uh, but there are some issues there. I think the IBM is the official provider there, but a lot of users are also using our MAP is to GPU version. I'll talk about that. And also, uh, recently we have been working very closely uh, with TAC. Uh, this is the Frontera system, uh, which is uh, coming up, uh, is already running, um, and uh, will be available publicly in another two, three weeks. Um, and uh, I am a partner, in fact, a co-PI of that, that grant. So this is just a very quick um, release time download kind of things. So continuously we are in a very uh, steady uh, rising curve. Uh, but more importantly, this is the kind of the architecture. Um, so this is like a, from at the top level, not only we support MPI, we also support all different versions of PGAS. We also support hybrid MPI and PGAS. This is very unique in the sense, in the same program, you can have some part MPI and some part open SMEM, or some part MPI plus OpenMP, some part UPC. You can mix and match all these different kind of programming models, and it's running under a unified communication runtime library, and so that it gives you complete flexibility for a programmer or a developer to mix and match different kinds of programming models. Um, so I call it like a diversity, you know, in any group. These days, there's a lot of focus on diversity. Uh, you try to identify strengths of the different people and try to assign them to the project so that the project gets completed in the best possible time. So same thing, I think, of the programming model. Not a single programming model is good for every application, but you can mix and match. And then at the bottom, we have support for all different networking technologies. Uh, we started this project with InfiniBand, but also support IOR, Rocky, Omnipath. And very latest, I'll talk about this, this is the AWS. They have the new adapter, which is called Elastic Fabric Adapter, or EFA. So we have support for that. And then, of course, we support all the different uh, uh, kind of uh, processor architecture, uh, not only the standard x86, open power. We had support for GN5. Um, that is gradually dying down, ARM, um, and also NVIDIA uh, GP GPUs. And then within that, these are our actually the research part. Um, um, the, all the features, and then of course all the different kinds of solutions we come up with. And we always like uh, write the papers, because from an academia that is the objective. We write the papers, uh, compare and contrast different designs. But then, in six to nine months, we take these designs and then push it into our software. And uh, even though we are in an academia, over the years we have invested a lot on the machines. In fact, there are almost 200 machines continuously running QA tests in my lab. So we have now capabilities that in 36 to 48 hours we know if we push some patch whether it works or not. Okay, so we go through very rigorous, like a, uh, the regular testing, unit testing, performance integrations, and all those things. And then before that, and then after that we push it out so that it is actually ready for any, any machines. So we have a lot of different versions, uh, but I'll be mostly focusing on the, this top three. Um, this is the basic version, this is an advanced version, this is the optimized uh, uh, GPU version. Uh, we also have a cloud version, but the cloud model is gradually changing, so people can also use our regular versions, so that's what um, I'll be talking. Then there is an energy aware version. We also have a lot of tools uh, not only energy monitoring tool, we also have a um, comprehensive network analysis and monitoring tool. Um, starting from, the, from a program perspective, you can actually see while you are running a job how the actual traffic is going on the network and relate to the job kind of things. And also we have uh, the standard micro benchmarks called OMB or OSU micro benchmarks, which a lot of people use um, all over the world. So let me then go into each of these three components the HPC part, big data part, and deep learning, and then say how we are trying to enable. So on the HPC side, I'll, I'll start. These are the kind of the three libraries we have. So the basic library, of course, people focus a lot on the latency and bandwidth, so that's how I'll start with. Um, these data is, are trying to show what has happened over the years with all different adapters. Um, so the left-hand side is trying to show small message latency, half of round trip. And we are hovering around like a one microsecond here. The large messages, of course, the bandwidth matter. Um, so here you will see the latest one, the ConnectX 
6 HDR, this is the 200 gigahertz per second, is trying to give you the uh, best uh, latency. Uh, then in terms of bandwidth, we have unidirectional bandwidth. This is the left graph. And here you can see very clear distinction. This is like the InfiniBand QDR, FDR, dual FDR or EDR and Omnipath. And now this is the HDR, uh, 200 gigabits. So this is like a 24.5 or 25 gigabits per second if you multiply by 8. So that's kind of the 200 gigabits uh, per second you see. And then this is the bidirectional bandwidth. And then here again, we, it is not exactly hitting 50 gigabytes per second, but we are around there, 48 uh, gigabytes per second. And um, of course, there are a lot of enhancement, tuning, firmware, all these are taking place. So this, that number soon should be coming to very close to 50 gigabytes per second. The Haswell memory bandwidth is pretty close to that. So Pardon me? The Haswell memory bandwidth isn't so great. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, so this is a, we try to take it on exactly on a similar machine so that we can compare kind of things. But of course, as the machines are changing, we need to reevaluate all these numbers on the, on the new machines. Thanks. So then that is kind of a point-to-point -point communication. But um, as many of you know, when we are trying to design an MPI library, there are so many um, primitives there. So we take a very holistic approach to optimize all the things and as well as the behavior. So one of the things is the startup. Okay? Many people don't uh, uh, take a look at it, but that is the very first problem anybody like who has deployed a system always faces. Like any large scale systems over the years we have seen, as the machine sizes are increasing, just like the Frontera currently has 8,000 nodes. Okay? So just think of like deploying an MPI library with a bringing up all these uh, 400, like half, half, million, uh, half a million core job. Okay? So we have been optimizing on all these for a long time. So, so here it is like a, some startup performance. Here you can see this on the Frontera. Three weeks back, we are working very closely with them in optimizing this. So just think of like a 57,000 processes on 1,000 nodes. We are able to bring it up in 3.9 seconds, below 4 seconds. Okay? Just count 1,000, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4. 57,000 processes have already started running. Okay? So that shows actually the, how fast you can move into these, these uh, large scale systems. So that is the, like the point to point startup, of course, collectives. Many of you know that plays a very big role and that has been a big area of research over the years and we have been spending a lot of time uh, uh, not only on the pure algorithms point of view, uh, but also trying to take advantage of like the SAR, newer kinds of interfaces which are coming. So here I'm trying to show a number. This was taken on the Stampede 2 on 10,000 processes. And here you can see like a, um, here we brought up with a new idea uh, called a multi-leader design. Uh, many times if you look at the literature, typically as the number of cores are increasing, uh, let's say you want to do a um, all reduce. So most of the time you reduce to a single leader, then across the network you do exchange, and then you do a broadcast. But as the number of cores are increasing, single leader may not be good because that could be the bottleneck. So we introduced a new library multi-leader design which was presented at the supercomputing 17 and then based on your message size you can actually adjust. Automatically the library will try to find out how many leaders do I need. Do I need two leaders or four leaders or eight leaders? Partition the job um, for that data and then here if you see if you do very optimized design you should be able to see like almost a 2.4x improvement uh, kind of things. And, and in our library, we have a lot of, not only our library, a lot of people have been investigating on this. This is becoming actually a big issue in any of the MPI libraries. And uh, we also have some lot of built-in tuning. Okay, so as the MPI library gets uh, deployed, it automatically detects. It has intelligence, it looks at what adapter it is running, how many cores, and then inside that we have a lot of like different kinds of tuning tables. So it's automatically trying to pick up um, that, uh, which is the best for message size, um, the number of PPNs and uh, the um, number of nodes. So it automatically goes and selects those things. Okay. So then, of course, uh, these are some new uh, designs we have been uh, introducing. Um, there is a new uh, module um, called XPMEM. Uh, how many of you heard of this, this terminology? Not many of you, okay, uh, glad or some of you. So, so if you go back in the history, what has happened like over the course, if you let's say shared memory, if I want to do an MPI, there is always a two copy approach. That means I write to a buffer and then you read it. But then you lose the performance. 
So many years back, even in our MHAPIS project, we originally started a kernel module called LIMIC. If some of you are old timer, you will be looking at that one. So it is a kernel based, so that means I actually map my address space to, 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 the, uh, to the other, other process, so you can actually do one copy instead of two copies. So now there is a much more advanced version, so that actually LIMIC concept has gone to the Linux kernel and that is known as CMA, okay? Cross memory attached, so you don't have to have a separate module. Directly you can utilize the calls and we support that. And very recent is the XP man, okay? So that is a much more advanced version. So I can map my address to yours or you can map your address to me. It is still single copy, but it performs much more better than XP man. So we take advantage of that to, to design not only point-to-point -point operations, but also collectives, okay? And these are some numbers here. Um, this was presented at an I IPDPS 18, but is already available in our MHAPIS 2X, which is our advanced version. So here you can see like, this is the, like the latency benefit. Uh, this is a OSU all reduce and then the reduced benchmarks. This is in log scale, so you can see like, compared to our older versions, even compared to other libraries, we can get a factor of 1.8X or even factor of 4X improvement, okay? So I'll strongly recommend, if you have a large number of cores you are running, um, system, so please use this kind of advanced module so that you should be able to give give a boost uh, to your applications. The another thing which have been, we have been working, again the other library has been working, but we have a very good solution which is called asynchronous progress. So many times what happens in the MPI, um, typically like, let's say I want to send you a large message, and typically I, it goes through a request, so I first do a RTS and then if you send me a CTS, then only the data transfer takes place. But then, if the receiver is in, the, in a big computation, you don't get that RTS. And that loses out your overlap capability of computation with communication. So to handle that, people have proposed like asynchronous progress design. Of course, there are a lot of solutions, whether you do through software or through hardware, using some additional threads, so all those solutions are there. In fact, we proposed a new solution where you don't need any additional thread, okay? So that is the kind of the unique design we brought it out. Uh, it was presented in the Euro MPI 2018. Um, so you don't need any additional dedicated resources, but you can still do the asynchronous progress. And then here you can see like, this is like a P3DFFT or HPL. Uh, lower is better, higher is better. Using this kind of new techniques, um, you should be able to get in higher performance. So this is already again available in our MHAPIS 2 X version. Um, all these designs are available with simple runtime variables. So you should be able to turn on and off and get this kind of numbers also, whatever I'm proposing. And then for your application and your environment, you see what kind of combinations work out the best and then use that for your, for your library. So those are like the some basic um, numbers. Of course, we have been working with a uh, lot of other different kind of platform. This is the Open Power. Uh, we work very closely with Open Power Consortium. So here again, you can see, um, these are some intra-node numbers. Um, so compared to like a Spectrum MPI, we are even able to give you like a better intra-node kind of performance. And uh, intra-socket, uh, this is the latency, and then this is the bandwidth. We have been working very closely with ARM. I know one of the presenters earlier presented uh, the ARM number. So in fact, uh, last year, or rather this year, we have a funding from ARM to optimize MAPIS2 for the ARM uh, systems. We are continuously uh, pushing uh, enhancements. So these are the very latest numbers has been taken on Sandia Meyer system, which is the open version of the Astra, uh, whatever was heard. So it is the Thunder X2. So here we are comparing like these are the latency of small, medium, and large messages. So the lower is better. And here bandwidth, again, it's the higher is better. So as you can see, this the MAPIS 2X has all these XP MEM and all those additional modules. Um, so here you can actually do, deliver very well in performance in the latency. As you can see, for large messages, we can give you almost 8.2x better, and then similar things you can do at, at the bandwidth. Then this is like the inter-socket, um, similar kind of things you can see. Um, the Almost we get a factor of 3.5x better here, or bandwidth also we get a almost by a factor of 5x here. Um, so as many of you people have these kind of ARM clusters, and these are all publicly available in our release. This is the MHAPIS 2X, not the MHAPIS 2. So you just need to make sure about that and please feel free to download that and use it. You will see this kind of uh, performance um, on, on these systems. 
So then coming to the GPU, a lot of GPU clusters are being deployed. Um, so in this context, in fact, we're the very first ones uh, to introduce something called a CUDA aware MPI library. How many of you have heard of this term? Some of you, okay. So the idea is that most of the time when you have some system like this, uh, you have a GPU, you have InfiniBand, then over the switches, if you have some data here, how do you transfer that data? So typically you try to do a CUDA mem copy to the host, then you try to do a MPI send, and then you again try to do an MPI receive and then do CUDA mem copy. So in the 2011, actually we published a paper at ISC um, here in Frankfurt. Um, I don't know, that was in Frankfurt or some, some other place, but ISC 11. So what we said is that, can we try to bring this into the MPI library so that the end user doesn't even have to know CUDA, okay? So we, we can do within the MPI itself. So that is the idea that, for example, if I know how to do MPI send and receive from the host buffer, you just, instead of the host buffer, you just say device buffer, sender, and receiver, and then see the animation. So the, within the MPI library, we should be able to do the data transfer. Because now with the multiple GPUs, there are a lot of paths. In fact, for every architecture, if you enumerate, these days almost 14 to 20, 30 paths, communication paths come. So for an end users to optimize all those paths are very hard. Whereas within MPI library, we can optimize because we know how the data is moving. And that was the idea that if we can do this kind of a CUDA aware library, we should be able to give you very good high performance and high productivity. Of course, over the years, a lot of other MPI libraries also have adopted this uh, design. If you take a look at the, the number, this is how we get. Currently, uh, you can try it on any of these GPU cluster from the one GPU over the network to the other GPU, we can deliver you a latency of 1.85 microsecond. Okay? Uh, we use all kind of the, not only the CUDA aware MPI concept, but we also use the GPU direct RDMA, where both the GPU and InfiniBand are sitting next to each other. We also use a library called GDR copy from the NVIDIA. So if you put all these things together, this is the kind of performance you will be getting. So normal, like from a node to node these days with InfiniBand is one microsecond. Using another 850 nanoseconds, we are able to move the data. Okay? And that not only gives you the latency, you also get very good benefits in terms of bandwidth and bidirectional bandwidth. And that reflects on your applications. Uh, if your applications, you try to make them CUDA aware, here it is an example of like a Humdi Blue, uh, which is a molecular dynamics application. Here you can see like the higher is better. Uh, you can increase the almost the performance by a factor of two. And this is our like a flagship um, project here. Uh, we have been working for the last several years. Uh, if you have visited Switzerland and whatever the real time weather forecasting is coming, in fact, we have been contributing to that through our project. Uh, at the CSCS, uh, there is a large cluster uh, and the Meteo Switch, which is their weather forecasting agencies. And we are working in a three-way collaboration to give the best performance. Um, for this um, uh, application. Then these are some standard like uh, benchmarks uh, across different kind of MPI libraries. In this case, we are comparing with Intel MPI. Uh, here you can see um, MFAP is to X. If you take it like over the, all the different micro benchmarks, you get like almost 29%, 11% to 31% benefit. These are some numbers from the tax template two. Uh, this is a very large scale system, as you can see, very easily we are able to scale these jobs to 4,000 cores, 8,000 cores kind of thing. These are the normal size jobs many people run on this large scale system. And uh, as I said earlier, like we are working with uh, TAC on the Frontera new system and you will be seeing some of the newer results uh, coming out soon. So then that is kind of the, the basic uh, MPI project. So then of course, um, as you know, a lot of people have been focusing on the data analytics. Um, so this is the typical kind of an architecture uh, for um, modern data centers, you try to do a, a lot of online processing. You also try to do a lot of offline processing. So around eight years back, we tried to ask the same questions that how we can redesign these stacks, just like what we did for the MPI library, how we can redesign the stacks for Hadoop or Spark, um, Memcached, those kind of stacks uh, to take advantage of InfiniMan and RDMA. So we have taken all these things like Hadoop, Spark, HBase, Memcached, Kafka, all these are major components in the big data world. And uh, <clears throat> this project is called High Performance Big Data or HIBD. Um, so if you go to this website, you should be able to download these packages. 
um, which uh, takes advantage of InfiniBand as well as Rocky. Um, it is available both for x86, also open power. We also have support for Singularity and Docker. So, so whether it is a dedicated environment or a cloud environment, you should be able to utilize all these stacks. So this is like a currently being used by around 315 organizations from 35 countries. Again, uh, we have more than like 31,000 downloads. Uh, these are the kind of the timeline and downloads um, for, for this project. So what we have done inside, you remember I indicated that the cluster, the cluster is running like a slum or luster, those kind of environments. So we have brought that kind of environment to these stacks. So for example, for the Apache Hadoop, we have an RDM enhanced SDFS. It has support for luster. We also have RDM enhanced MapReduce. We also have RDM enhanced RPC. It also has interface to the job schedulers like Slurm and PBS. Okay? So if you are running any kind of this kind of environment, whether Slurm or PBS with Luster, this, you don't have to do anything else. So this has already the appropriate scripts and the hooks so that it will just run on the, on the same system. And uh, performance wise, um, here I'm trying to show some performance. This is like the Hadoop 3.x. That is the new latest release we have done. So here you can see this is running on the same InfiniBand platform, uh, EDR. But this is the standard Hadoop. And then this is our RDM Hadoop. So you can see like the test DFS IO, which is the latency, or here is the throughput. We should be able to give you almost factor of 1.4 or 3.4 X improvement. It is exactly the same hardware. It is the software stack, which is trying to uh, give you the boost in the performance. So with this kind of like a design, so this is what I was telling, just like MPI, you have different kinds of libraries. You download it, configure it for your platform, and make them available as modules. Same thing you can try to do. You download our um, uh, RDMA Hadoop based on your system configuration, like how much disk space you have, Luster or PBS. Try to configure it once, and then try to make it available for your users. And that's what we have done. In fact. Uh, we work very closely with San Diego Supercomputing Center. Uh, there are some of our collaborators are there. So on the SDAC Comet system, if any one of you have an account, you don't have to do any of these installations and all. The Hadoop is, or RDM Hadoop is available. You just as an end user, just link to that module and then proceed with your job. Okay. Similar kind of things we have done for Spark. Um, so the same uh, Spark, uh, we have done um, similar kind of like RDM based designs. We have uh, brought it here. Um, here again, you can see the, uh, like a, let's say, high bench uh, page rank. Uh, this is a very common benchmarking there. Uh, you can see uh, for, uh, in this case, like a 768 core page rank total time, we ca I can give you like a almost 37% benefit or 43% benefit. Um, exactly on the same hardware, uh, but uh, trying to use the new software, uh, you should be able to get performance. Same thing you can also do here, just uh, download the RDMA Hadoop, uh, sorry, RDMA Spark and then configure it and make it available to your um, end users. So then moving into the deep learning, I mean, as many of you know, there's a lot of discussion going on. We already had uh, several talks uh, in, the, in the morning. Now, this is the big picture people have been w trying to work on, um, especially for the, the training part of the deep learning. Okay, so this is where people were continuously want to uh, reduce the time, and people want both scale up and scale out. Um, that means more and more number of GPUs uh, or more number of CPU scores are within the node. You want to get the best performance. And also, if you cannot do it within one node, then you try to go into multiple nodes. So that is like a scale out. So in this context, of course, there are a lot of different solutions are being proposed. Um, of course, the NVIDIA and Intel have been focusing a lot on their basic libraries like a CUDNN or MKLDNN. But then you want to scale up. Um, so this is where like the NVIDIA has the nickel library. Um, I'll show how you can scale things from the MPI perspective. And then, of course, people have been also trying to, trying to use to scale through Hadoop or even gRPC, which is the Google RPC. And broadly, as a community, we want to go into this, this corner. That means which will give you the best scale up and then the best scale out. So in this context, we are trying to provide three kinds of solution here. Um, the two of them are purely MPI based. One is for CPU learning, CPU based learning, another is GPU based learning. We also have the traditional like kind of the TensorFlow people are using through gRPC and we have also accelerated that with RDMA. So if some of you are using that, you should be able to also use our solutions. So let me try to say, share some of the things, CPU based, uh, GPU based, and then the 
RDMA enabled TensorFlow. So this is the kind of the CPU base. So as you remember earlier, I said MLAPIS 2X, that has a lot of advanced support. And most of these deep learning, if some of you have worked on, you will see the what determines the performance is a one of the collectives, which is the all reduce. If, if you can provide a very good support for all reduce, you will see your, your uh, deep learning jobs will run much more faster, the training. And that's what we have done. Earlier, if you remember MHAPIS 2X, I indicated this XPMAM and all these additional protocols are there. And uh, here you can see that with an MHAPIS 2 XPMAM, uh, we presented these results in IPDPS 18. You can see almost, uh, this is a CNTK, AlexNet training. Uh, you can try to get almost like a 20%, 9% benefit. Okay, these are pure CPU-based solutions. So if you have a CPU-based platform, you should be able to utilize this and then try to get good performance. These are very latest number. In fact, these are under review, but I'm trying to show these were taken over the weekend as the Frontera system is coming. Um, so we were able to run some 2K node experiment, okay? But uh, if you take a look at the Frontera, it is actually a cascade lake with 56 cores. The node is very powerful with a lot, lot of uh, cores. So then the thing is when you are trying to run all these things, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, etc. First, you need to determine that we can get the best performance within a node, okay? And many times people have, again, tried to run this, saying, yeah, I have 16 cores, so just let's well, take only one MPI and use all the threads. But that we did, here if you see this analysis, you will see that that may not be the best. The best is around four to eight PPN, okay? So, so that's how we converted first, trying to do all this like a TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, with four to eight PPN, that was the uh, that was the best, and then we tried to scale it. So this is almost hundred thousand cores uh, we are running, uh, and here you can see like these are the kind of performance we are seeing. Um, images per second. This is like a TensorFlow. This is uh, uh, Keras, and then uh, this is the MXNet and Pytorch. They are not doing as good, but uh, if we just take the TensorFlow, so we are almost getting linear speed up here. Okay, up to 2,000 nodes, so that means 114,000 cores, and we can actually take ResNet 50 and train it in seven minutes on this on this system. Okay, so there are no GPUs, pure CPUs. If you have this access to this large scale system, you should be able to get very good performance here. So we should, we are also trying to provide this kind of a, uh, a path to, to the people because. Overall, if you see, there, there's a lot of CPU clusters out there. And people should be able to take advantage of that uh, for, uh, for deep learning. Then, of course, uh, GPU has been there for many years. I mean, that has been good for deep learning. So here, these are some of the numbers uh, from Summit, uh, the number one system. So here, we have taken uh, scaled things up to 1,500 GPUs. Okay? So here, you can see, this is like the latency. That is the already used latency, what, what I indicated earlier. So here we are comparing our MPI-based solution because MPI has the all reduce. It has been optimized for over the years. We are continuously trying to optimize and we are comparing with the latest NECL. That is the NVIDIA's collective communication libraries. Um, and here you can see like we can deliver you almost 1.6x better. Bandwidth we can give you like a 1.7x better for large messages. And this is the range in which a lot of these deep learning applications are running. And then the right hand side here we are trying to compare with the Spectrum MPI and also Nickel, also Open MPI, and many cases we saw things were not even running uh, in a stable manner to 1,500 GPUs. Whereas we are able to scale with our MAPIS2 based solution, you, you can get very good performance. Again, this MAPIS2 GPU Direct HDMI version is publicly available. Anybody can download and use it. You don't even need a root access or anything. In fact, at Summit, a lot of these users are now started running our stack, um, because you can just, as an end user, just install it in your directory and should be able to take advantage of this. This is also very one, one of the latest numbers we got a few weeks back. Uh, um, this is again has run on Summit uh, with 1536 volters. This is Ima ImageNet 1000, not ImageNet 50. ImageNet 50, most of the people are running. Um, so this has 1.2 million images. And we are able to utilize 1500 GPUs and we are able to get almost like here you can see, um, uh, in fact, after 96 nodes, um, we are not able to run with the latest nickel, but we are able to scale with the MAPIS2 up to 1500 GPUs, and we are able to get 0.35 million images per second. 
And, uh, and here you can see, like with a 90 epochs, we can actually train the ImageNet 1K in 5.5 minutes, okay, using uh, 1500 GPUs kind of stuff. So if you have a GPU cluster, again, once again, I'll strongly encourage you to, to use our library so you should be able to utilize and then get this kind of performance for your deep learning applications. And then, of course, a lot of people are trying to use deploy these days on the GPU clusters in the cloud. So we have also enabled our MHPs to GDR on a container. You can try to see, like with a Docker, very little overhead degradation. You can actually put it together with all your stacks, and you should be able to deploy it on your um, GPU platforms. So then we have also enabled the RDMA TensorFlow, because some people are still using the traditional TensorFlow with the gRPC, which is the Google RPC which is the lower level uh, communication library. So what we have done is we took uh, that gRPC library and just like we accelerated MPI and our big data stack, we have accelerated the gRPC stack itself. And then with that, if you put it uh, together with uh, the TensorFlow, these are the kind of the numbers um, you see. Uh, we have evaluated for all different batch sizes, CPU sizes. There are also a lot of different kind of solutions available. Um, the red bar, higher is better, that is our solution. Okay, so that actually delivers much more higher performance compared to all other uh, versions out there. And as I said, you should be able to like just go to this high DL. So this is the high performance uh, deep learning site, a project site. You should be able to download and, and utilize this. So, so just like uh, I told earlier, not only like your MPI job, so now you can even take one of these MRPs to GDR or RDMA TensorFlow, just make them again modules available. It will exactly run on your same system. You don't have to do any difference and then make them available to your users. And now the bigger benefit, what you will see, because if it is running on your same system, people can actually come up with better workflows. Okay? So traditionally, like people have seen, okay, I do the HPC job, come back later on, I do deep learning. Now they are running on the same system, same file system. You should be able to mix and match. Uh, take any workflow saying, okay, first I want to do some uh, basic uh, computing. After that, I may need to do a little bit of deep learning, follow, follow, come back to do data analytics. So people can imagine now better and better workflows, which could not be possible earlier. Okay, So that's what we are trying to enable to the community. And then the final thing I'll talk about the cloud, uh, because all the software, so whatever we have developed, are running already on a dedicated systems, but people want to use the cloud. So here we have been doing collaboration with uh, two of these uh, major vendors now, the AWS and then Azure. So on the Azure, we have actually made a public deployment. Uh, so this is a one-click deployment. Uh, as you know, the any of the cloud, you have to go through a lot of these steps. And we worked uh, very closely with Azure. So if you go to our MAPIS2 site, uh, there is an MAPIS2 Azure page, there is a link. Just that's all you need to do. One-click deployment, it directly takes you to, to your, your page, and already MAPIS2 is installed there, and everything you should just run. You should just link to your applications, and that's all you need to um, need to do. And uh, <coughs> Gilad mentioned some of these numbers. Um, I didn't include here, but if you go to the MAPIS2 website, we have actually go to the Azure performance page, and you will see those kind of numbers, 1.3 microsecond. I think that's what we are seeing um, on the Azure. Here, there are some application numbers. I'm just trying to show some radix. Um, um, this is like the total execution time. Uh, um, as you can see, like compared to HPCX, uh, here we are trying to deliver much more better. Uh, this is on the HC environment. This is the HB. Uh, HC is the x86, and then the HB is the um, AMD. And uh, now they are deploying the MD ROM, so we are working with them um, also on, on that. And so then on the other one, the uh, AWS, as I indicated, AWS traditionally has been only Ethernet. Um, they don't use InfiniBand, but they came up with a newer adapter, which is called Elastic Fabric Adapter. Um, so that has some kind of an RDMA capability, but it's not strictly like an InfiniBand. So we worked with them. They have a new protocol called Scalable Reliable Datagram. Or called, called SRD. Uh, those of you are familiar with InfiniBand, you will see UD, RC, um, those were there. So now there is a newer protocol here, SRD. So we actually put our MAPIS to X stack with SRD. So we came up with a new design. We presented it at the Hot, I, um, Hot Interconnect Conference uh, just uh, <coughs> last month. And this is how you see um, here it's trying to show like a, um, this is a mini ghost, a Cloverleaf, 
uh, compared to like the OpenMPI, which is running there with LibFabrics solution, um, our solution delivers much more better performance, even at the application layer. So this is again publicly available. If you go to our MHAPIS2 site, uh, download, there is an MHAPIS2X AWS, and we have provided you a very small user guide. You should be able to just download our stack and then run it uh, as long as you have um, you have the access to these, uh, they are HPC instances. So they have a lot of these instances, so if you have the HPC instance, you should be able to run this. So with this, let me conclude here uh, what I tried to show um, as we are heading into the exascale world. We need to make sure that we take a holistic view of all these things like HPC, big data, deep learning, and cloud so that we can have solutions which will not only run on the exascale, but people should be able to run exactly the same environments on the cloud and can go back and forth. So that is the kind of the new direction the community is heading. And then I provided an overview of designing this kind of convergent software stacks and uh, which can help uh, people to move along this direction. But I also want to indicate to, towards the end uh, there's some new developments which have taken place. Some of you might not be familiar. Um, of course, we have been from the OSU side, we have been like trying to provide all these solutions to the community, but a lot of people want commercial solutions um, or commercial support. So we have a, um, uh, our commercial branch, this is actually Xscale solution, in fact, this is also a sponsor of this event. Um, so through this, we can actually provide you commercial support. Um, we can work with you, the users, or in fact, we can use a, work with also vendors, third party, all possibilities have now opened up. And in fact, for the last two years, we are providing support uh, to the Lawrence Limerman National Lab. Uh, they are the, one of the largest MIPST users with very large scale machines. So through this, we are able to provide very dedicated kind of a support, all kinds of optimizations, not only at the library layer, but also an application layer with the first turnaround time, uh, fastest response time kind of things. And uh, we are also through this uh, thing, um, it is also a part of the Open Power Consortium. Uh, we are a Silver ISP member. Uh, in fact, a few weeks back, uh, there was an Open Power North America Summit uh, took place at San Diego. In fact, we introduced some two integrated products, um, like uh, Xscale AI and then Xscale HPC. Um, so it has all our, not only our stacks, but it also combines TensorFlow and everything. So just like a one-click deployment, you should be able to download and build and run. You don't have to spend like seven days to, to build all these stacks and then trying to optimize, okay? So I'll be happy to, to talk if some of you people are interested. There is a, is, this is an email, um, contact us. Uh, you can send us an email for a free trial. Uh, you should be able to download and then run it on your systems. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to provide you support through this, this organization. And I also want to indicate like uh, as the MHAPIS project has been growing, uh, every year we do an MHAPIS um, user group meeting. Uh, we call it MUG. Um, so we hold it uh, like uh, August, so it was held like a few weeks back. Uh, um, Gilad and, uh, was there also a speaker. So we had a very interesting talks uh, from all over the world. Uh, I think from UK, uh, we had uh, Jeffrey Salmon and then uh, I think uh, uh, Nick also from the EPCC presented the talk. Uh, so all these talks are actually available. Uh, um, please feel free to take a look at that. And uh, for the next year, we'll also be continuing. This is the seventh meeting, we'll be doing the eighth meeting. If some of you are interested in sharing uh, some of your results at this event, we'll be happy to, to invite you. Uh, once again, the idea is that people can share all their things, what works, what doesn't work, and uh, to learn from um, each other. So that is the goal. So with this, let me thank all our sponsors. But more importantly, these are all my heroes. Um, what I'm presenting here is like a summary of 20 years of work, um, how the project has involved a lot of people past students and staffs, uh, as well as current students and staffs. Um, they have done all the hard work or they are doing all the hard work and I just come here <laughs> and talk. So, um, so always I'd like to um, thank them. Uh, but more importantly, I'm continuously looking for good people. Okay? Um, so if there are some students here or who would like to come as a postdocs, research fellows, please uh, let me know. Um, so that if you come and work with us, your name will go to that previous page. Okay? <laughs> So with this, let me um, finish here, and I think we are almost matching with the, with, with the time. So we recovered, and uh, I think this is the lunch time. Uh, if there are any quick questions, I'll be happy to answer now. Um, otherwise, I'm here throughout the day, and I'll be happy to talk to you in person. Any quick questions? <laughs>
Yes. You're more-